Hello everybody, thank you for joining us today for our second online service of the International Christian Fellowship in Botima, Portugal. First of all, I'd like to begin by telling you a story. There was once a man walking down a road on a very windy day, when suddenly there was a huge gust of wind that blew his hat off, and it went rolling down the street. The dog noticed the moving hat, was intrigued by it, and picked it up between his teeth and ran back to his owner's garden, where he proceeded to make it his newest toy to chew on. The man who had lost his hat went running after the dog, followed him through the garden and knocked angrily on the door of the house. When the owner appeared, the angry man explained what had happened and demanded a new hat. The owner refused point blank. It's not my fault, he said. The wind blew your hat off. The angry man stated indignantly, I don't like your attitude. Whereupon the owner of the dog said, Look, mate, it wasn't my attitude, it was yours. And so the title of my message today is An Attitude of Gratitude. We've all heard the proverbial question about whether the glass of water is half full or half empty. Well, it's both, isn't it? But what we see depends entirely on our perspective. In the same way, we can choose to be grateful for the half glass that we do have, or we can complain about the half glass that we don't have. God wants us to be thankful. He wants us to see the water that is in the glass. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 16 to 18 says, Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. At times like this in our world when we watch the news and every day we hear reports of several thousand more people becoming ill with this terrible coronavirus and hundreds of people dying every single day all over the world, it's easy to become despondent. And as we find our own freedom of movement being taken away and realize we can't go out and do the things that we used to, it's easy to become depressed. Yet God has told us that we should always be thankful. The truth is that in spite of our circumstances, there are still so many things to be grateful for. Now most of you are probably familiar with the hymn, Now Thank We All Our God. The first verse goes like this. Now thank we all our God, with heart and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done, in whom this world rejoices, who from our mother's arms has blessed us on our way, with countless gifts of love, and still is ours today. Now what you may not know is that this hymn, written by Martin Rinkert, was composed during the Thirty Years' War, of 1618 to 1648. During the Great Plague of 1637, Rinkart was the only minister in his town of Eilenburg in Saxony, Germany. During that year alone, he conducted about four and a half thousand funeral services, sometimes as many as 50 or 60 a day. Yet in the midst of these terrible circumstances, he wrote this beautiful hymn of thanks to God. As he and his family sat down to the mere scraps of food that they had on their table, they looked beyond their circumstances to a gracious God who had provided for them, and they gave him thanks. And that is the secret. We have to look beyond our circumstances to our gracious God who provides for us. Even in the midst of a terrible situation, there are many things to be thankful for. I was encouraged last weekend to see the news reports from Italy, which, as you all know, is the European country worst hit by the coronavirus. In cities all over the country, people took their balconies at night and burst into song, 
Opera singers delighted their neighbours with beautiful arias. Young parents and children played on musical toys. Even little old ladies beat rhythms on saucepan lids. It was a wonderful sight and a wonderful show of solidarity and support for each other. People waved and smiled to neighbours that they'd never met before. Their joy was contagious. And so the next evening at, at 10 o'clock in Portugal, people all over the country here, from north to south, also took to their balconies and gave loud applause and shouts of gratitude to all the doctors and nurses who are working so hard around the clock to save lives and care for those who are ill. And I'm sure it must have been a tremendous boost and encouragement to all the exhausted healthcare workers and it certainly lifted the spirits of all those who took part and also those of us who watched the videos later on TV. Did you know that gratitude is actually good for you? It turns our attention away from ourselves. Secular research studies show that gratitude makes people both happier and healthier. They sleep better. They have less pain. They live longer. They're less materialistic, more optimistic, have better marriages. They're less selfish and they're better at bouncing back from stress. Gratitude is good for us. A Trappist monk by the name of Thomas Merton wrote these wise words. To be grateful is to recognize the love of God in everything he has given us. And he has given us everything. Every breath we draw is a gift of his love. Every moment of existence is a grace for it brings with it immense graces from him. Gratitude, therefore, takes nothing for granted, is never unresponsive, is constantly awakening to a new wonder and to praise of the goodness of God. For the grateful person knows that God is good, not by hearsay, but by experience. And that's what makes all the difference. The Bible has much to teach us on the subject of gratitude. The Psalms are full of exhortations to give thanks. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is good. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And in the New Testament, Paul was a man who faced many adverse circumstances. The book of Acts is his travel log, which details one near disaster after another. In Pisidian Antioch, Paul and Barnabas were persecuted and expelled from the region. In Iconium, they had to flee for their lives as they were about to be stoned. In Lystra, Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city, presumed to be dead. In Philippi, he and Silas were brought before the magistrates, stripped, beaten, and severely flogged, and then thrown into prison. In Thessalonica, a mob started a riot and went searching for Paul and Silas to bring them to justice. In Corinth, Paul was opposed by a group of verbally abusive Jews. In Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on him and brought him to court. In Jerusalem, he was arrested, beaten, bound with chains, flogged, struck on the mouth, and then he was tried before Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. On his long journey to Rome, he was shipwrecked off the coast of Malta, was attacked there by a poisonous snake, and he finally arrived in Rome to stand trial before Caesar. Now, if anyone had a set of bad circumstances, it was Paul. Yet this was the man who had learned to be thankful regardless. In Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13, he says, 
I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And here Paul is writing to the church in Philippi. It was in their city that he and Silas had been thrown into jail for helping a slave girl come to know Jesus. Yet in the darkest hour of the night, with their feet locked in the stocks, Paul and Silas sang hymns of praise to God, with their hearts full of thanksgiving. Not thanksgiving because of their circumstances, but thanksgiving in spite of their circumstances. The result was a mighty earthquake, the jailer coming to know the Lord, and the beginning of the church in Philippi. It's God's will for us to be thankful. This is the mindset that he wants us to have. He wants us to see the glass as half full, not half empty, and to be grateful. He wants us to be thankful in all circumstances. Now it's easy to be thankful when things are going well. But scripture talks about a thankfulness of heart which persists even when our situation changes. In Colossians 3 verses 15 to 17, Paul has more to say about being thankful. He writes these words, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In just two verses, Paul tells us three times to have an attitude of gratitude. This is something which has to be deliberately cultivated. When things are going well, it may come naturally. But at other times, we have to make a deliberate choice to be thankful. Apart from being a command <clears throat> that we need to obey, being thankful has many other distinct advantages. First of all, gratitude keeps us from complaining, just as we can't breathe in and breathe out at the same time, nor can we be thankful and complain at the same time. It's just not possible. Philippians 2 verse 14 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God in a crooked and depraved generation, in which you shine like stars in the universe. And secondly, gratitude keeps us from coveting. If we're sincerely grateful for what we have, we won't be wishing that we had something else. Remember the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet. Thirdly, gratitude makes us content. Hebrews 13.5 tells us, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And fourthly, gratitude makes us joyful. Today's gratitude is tomorrow's joy. When we say thank you to someone, a smile appears on several faces, ours, theirs, and God's. Gratitude makes everyone happy and feel better. The Bible teaches us that in both the good times and the bad, we are to give thanks. When life is easy, give thanks. When life is challenging, keep on giving thanks. Because God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love for us is still the same, and our thanks should be the same too. 
Giving thanks isn't just saying a prayer before a meal. It's a way of life, an attitude of gratitude. And what about us? What can we be thankful for right now? Well, we may have to stay at home, but at least we have a home to stay in. We can be thankful for that. And some of the shelves at the supermarket might well be empty, but at least we have some food on our table. We may not be able to travel, but at least we have phones and the internet to stay in touch with our family and friends. And if you're watching this today, at least you have the health and strength to do so. So we have much to be thankful for. It's strange that this, but this past week I found myself being thankful for some rather unusual things, such as the builders banging and drilling in the empty house next door to us. Whereas in the past year, sometimes the noise has been annoying. Now it feels good to hear signs of life, to know that someone else is around and alive. And on the sunny days this week, I found some of the birds in the garden to be exceptionally beautiful. Maybe it's because it's so quiet that I just notice them more. Or maybe it's because their confident singing reminds me that we have a wonderful God who really is going to take care of us. Now most of you are familiar with the Christian songwriter and singer Darlene Czech from Australia. Darlene grew up in a musical family and even sang some TV commercials when she was a child. So music came naturally to her as a way of expressing herself. As a teenager she struggled when her parents went through a painful divorce. And then as a young wife and mother she struggled again as her husband Mark's motorcycle business was failing fast and he was barely able to support her and their two children. She honestly didn't know how they were going to cope and she was at the end of her rope. On one particularly gloomy day, not knowing what the future held, Darlene was reading in the Psalms and sat down at her old piano that she'd had since she was five years old. Some of the images of God that she'd read about in the Psalms were still ringing in her ears and touched her heart. My comfort, my shelter, power of refuge and strength. And she began to express these truths in song. And there, in the midst of adversity, one of the best loved praise songs of all time was born. In Darlene's time of distress, as she turned her thoughts towards God, she realized that she still had so much to be thankful for. And today, in spite of this terrible epidemic that surrounds us on all sides in just about all countries, we too can choose to have an attitude of gratitude. We can look beyond our circumstances to the wonderful God who sustains us. In other words, our attitude doesn't depend on our circumstances. It depends on our hearts. If our hearts are focused on God, who is our comfort and our strength, then we will realize just how much we have to be thankful for. Amen.
Let's pray together. Oh dear Lord, we do thank you for who you are. Lord, once again we thank you that you do not change. And even though our circumstances are disturbing and changing constantly from one hour to the next, Lord, we thank you that you do not change. Thank you, Lord, that you really are our comfort, our strength, our tower of refuge, and that we can always come to you, and that you'll always be there for us. Lord, today we thank you for what we have. Even though we don't have all the freedom we had a few weeks ago, we thank you that we have our lives. Thank you that we have our health. Thank you that we have our families. Thank you that we have food on our tables and a place to live. Lord, we can't take those things for granted because we know there are many who don't have those things that we sometimes take for granted. Lord, we thank you for our country of Portugal. We thank you for our president who's doing all he can to keep us safe. We thank you for our government and we continue to pray that you'd help them in the decisions that they make for our good. Lord, we thank you for all the doctors and nurses who are working so hard around the clock to save lives and care for those who are ill. We thank you for everybody who's doing so much to help others. And Lord, we do pray for an end to this epidemic. We do look to you for strength. We thank you, Lord, that a vaccine is being developed and we pray that it will be available soon so that people can benefit from it all over the world. And Lord, at this anxious time, we lift up to you everybody who is worried, who is afraid, especially those who don't know you, Lord. They have nowhere to turn. And we pray that during this difficult time, there might be many who come to find you as they look for somewhere where they can put their trust and find help. And for those of us who do know you, Lord, we thank you for the great privilege of knowing you, and we pray that we might trust you completely and not be afraid. Lord, we lift up to you our whole church family, both in Portugal, in the UK, in Canada, around the world, in many different countries. We know there's many people joining us today, and we lift up each one as we meet today to worship you in our homes. Thank you, Lord, that we can still meet in this way. And we thank you that you are a wonderful, unchanging God. You'll never let us down. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.